Welcome to Tim Stories, World Shakers. This is a cool show and we're getting good feedback. And the idea is to interview people that I think are world shakers, that they are making an impact on this world, making it a better place. And uh, such as my guest today, Akbar Sheikh. How you doing today, man? Pretty good, man. Appreciate you having me. I like your vibe. You look like you're kind of calm. <laughs> my wife just left, so yeah, I'm, I'm more calm than usual. <laughs> <laughs> That's super funny. All right, so I'm going to give you a proper introduction. You're an award-winning funnel coach, best-selling author, comma, an international speaker, okay? And then you are known as the coach's coach. That's yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> All right? And you help experts accelerate their growth and maximize their profits and impact on them through coaching. And um, I think that's kind of part of what you do. You're doing a lot of other great things as well. But um, let me ask you a question. When you were a young person, let's say 10, 11, 12 years of age, what are some things you were thinking about doing in life? You know, it's interesting, uh, Tim. I, you know, I remember in school, matter of fact, first grade, I was in, I was in Jersey. Well, for those of you who don't know New Jersey, um, and we had an assembly and people and the teachers like, and, and what happens is that each kid's got, got to go in line. They got to stand in line and they got to say, they got to walk up and say, what do I want to do? And people's like, I want to be a fireman and I want to be a, an astronaut and this and that. And it's the first grade. And I walk up and I say, I want to be a businessman. <laughs> and matter of fact, yeah, exactly. The whole audience started laughing. Um, it's because, frankly, my dad is, is an entrepreneur, and he, frankly, never really gave us much of a choice. He, uh, <laughs> he kind of always told us since we were young that you're going to be an entrepreneur. So I never really thought about it. That, that's always what was in my head. Where, where do you think you got that idea besides your father? Was there maybe something on television where you saw a businessman, or maybe you were in a mall, you saw a guy with a suit? Do you think something, what do you think happened to you? My dad has seven brothers, six sisters. Okay. And we all lived in New Jersey. So I had a lot of cousins, each and every one of the brothers, except for one and each and every one of the sisters uh, was an entrepreneur. So all I saw in my life were really entrepreneurs primarily in the, in the initial stages. You know, I tell people that there's, three ways you can learn in life. Uh, observation by what you see, conversation by dialoguing, and education, okay? In the area of observation, what did you observe in a, as a young person, whether good or bad, that made you who you are today? Um, did you see somebody that had made it, or maybe you saw people who did not do well, what did you observe as a young person that made you a little bit more of who you are today? That's interesting. I never thought about it. It's a good question. Um, so today I like to be considered one who spreads. Uh, you see, it's interesting. I, I, I'm trying to redefine the word giving because I think, I think people got it wrong. So I'm trying to kind of spread that message. And, you know, my, I guess, you know, I spent a lot of time like on the weekends with my dad and stuff. And you see, he was never really, my dad was not materialistic, right? He had a, he had a basic Lincoln. I mean, he made a lot of money, but he had a basic Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Mark seven, he, or whatever it was. We, we lived in a basic house, you know, he never really cared. It was never about the money. It was always about building something like a legacy, building something that could support people building. Um, you see, it's interesting, man. Like I'm not, I, and nothing against Gary Vee or anything. I just like, I'm not, I, I, I've never seen too much of his stuff. Yeah. Um, but I have a big picture of him and me here, right in my office, like hugging each other. Why? I never, I've never listened to more than 15 minutes of this guy in my life. It's because I did go to attend one conference from him and, or one lecture. And he says, somebody asked him, why are you doing all this stuff, bro? Why, why are you doing all this stuff? It's like all the time. It's like, man, I'm building a spaceship. Yeah. And what he's like, I'm gonna, I'm building this following, I'm building this movement so that I can point it towards a problem like cancer or something, and I can zap it away. Yeah. And in a way, and that touched me so much that you know he's he's a pretty vulgar guy and stuff like it's not really my jam, but I've got a big picture of him right here with me. 
because that touched me so much. But my dad, you know, and I, and I appreciate and I thank you for asking me this question, Tim, because I never thought about this. But, you know, I guess my dad had that same impact on me when I was much younger because he just wanted to build. My dad was in retail. He just yeah. wanted to open stores and stores and stores. And he wanted to support. He would hire community members and he would hire people. You know, he would he would hire people who needed help, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and he kept trying to build something for good, not to buy a new Rolex or anything like that. He, 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 he was building for, for good. So, man, this has been an awesome interview for me because I never thought about that. And you just made yeah, me go through a serious one of the things oh. that I take away from your um, great answer is that a lot of things are motives and that we don't have to have similar motives to get to the same places. Like, I'm, I'm very much the same. I'm a humanitarian. So I, I, I move a lot from my heart or to find a need and fill it. Where a lot of my contemporaries, they're always thinking about the money side. I really do not think about the money side. The money came um, just because I did things that worked. But a lot of times we'll turn money things down to go down the street to go do other projects that we know are nonprofit, but we get equally as blessed or we get blessed from other things in life. But I, I also think that when you have right motives and you just want to be a servant, it takes a lot of pressure off you. It is, you know, it's interesting, man. I was, so I'm doing a TEDx talk um, next month and I'm, I'm kind of like massaging that a little bit. And that's exactly what I'm talking about in the sense that like people, like it kind of bothers me when I see like the younger generation, man, they see somebody with like a nice car or a nice house or something or a nice watch or whatever. And like, man, I want to be rich, you know? And I see that and it kind of bothers me because I'm like, man, you don't know. Those guys are depressed, man. Generally speaking, a lot of them are depressed. And they, I, in other words, you want to be rich because you, you want to be rich because you want that. You think that stuff's going to get you happiness. But in reality, those guys are, a lot of those guys are like alcoholics and so on and so forth because they're depressed. Yeah. And the reality is what's interesting is that like I find like the real bank account is in here and depositing uh, the gift of giving. And I have memories in here that's like illuminating my heart that's making me content. And those memories have nothing to do about a six figure launch, seven figure launch, anything like that. I don't really care to be honest with you. It's been like the, the, the memories of been able to like, you know, give to orphans or yeah. the blind or clean water. And those, you know, no one can take that money out of here. Nobody can take that deposit out, you know? Yeah, I, I, I really like that. And I did not um, miss the fact that you said you're doing a TED Talk because number one, a lot of people want to do TED Talks and they're never asked to do TED Talks. <laughs> and you have to jump through a lot of hoops to do a TED Talk before mm-hmm. you land on their stage. So tell me about that journey. What are you going to be speaking on? The TEDx talk, uh, I'm basically uh, redefining the word. I'm talking about how to get rich by giving. Okay. Uh, and how do you, do you like that? Do you like that headline? We just came, I just came up with that. Or we just came up with that today. Listen, I'm very good. In fact, I'm not going to lie. I honestly think I'm one of the best at, at taglines. Uh-huh. And a lot of people use my taglines. <laughs> yeah. So, I think that that is really, really good. Oh, that's good news. Play on words. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So I, exactly correct. I've had, so I've had some weird dreams in my life, right? I wanted, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be an international best-selling author. I wanted to do certain things. Um, so for a while, I've wanted to be on the TEDx stage. So I, first, like, the first thing I did, step one, is I called my shop. I put it out there, guys, I want to give a TEDx shot. Anyone here can help me out. I don't know the first thing. How do I get on stage? I don't know how to. Somebody reached out. Apparently, someone's following my content. And she's in that world. So she's like, look, I can sponsor you. I can um, vote for you. I can recommend you. That's all I can do, though. So I'm like, please, that'd be great. So she did. And that was enough to get me an audition. And as a matter of fact, the first edition, um, I didn't pass. Oh. And actually, they never even told me I didn't pass. Yeah. Um, and this is the thing that, and this is one takeaway, you know, that people could take is I was tenacious about it. And I noticed like that, that, that word is so powerful and that a lot of times is the difference between the ones who make it and the ones who don't, because 
I followed up with them. I said, listen, hey, what happened? Hey, listen, I want to be on this. This is my, my childhood dream. I'll do or my dream. I'll do whatever it takes. Tell me what went wrong. I'm, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to audition. I got to make this happen. And they told me, said, hey, listen, it was a little too technical, which is funny because I'm a story guy. I said it needed more story because yeah. I wrote my own speech and sometimes the cobbler, you know, has no shoes. And I, when I reread it, and, and truth be told, I'm not making excuses, but I, kinda, I had to write it at the last minute right before a deadline because I was late. But um, anyway, I rewrote it with more story and then we got it. Yeah. But that never would have happened. You see, a lot of, most people, they don't follow up. They, they give up. They don't ask for things. Do you see what I'm saying? But you have to be very proactive, I think. I, li I like that answer. And remember I said at the beginning, you got to jump through a lot of hoops. Mm -hmm. I give you credit for jumping through all those. Yeah. Get to a point because you can affect a lot of people with these TED Talks. I hope so. Yes. I, I hope so. Okay. I have a question about mentors for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. You would agree with me that having the right mentors is important, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, outside of your family members, yeah. Um, who is a mentor that helped you? Maybe let's say in your twenties. <laughs> Twenty. I was a junkie for most of my twenties, but twenties uh, <laughs> uh, might be a little bit of a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> so quick. I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> you. You had a, a challenge. Yeah. Well, yeah. More than one, but yeah. <laughs> so you weren't listening too much to people. Well, you know, Tim, I'll be honest, you ask a lot of great questions, man, because, um, listen, I, okay, so I, I've had a lot of issues. I've been a, a staunch gambling problem, alcoholic, um, womanizer, addicted to anything you can think of. I, I, I had a lot of bad habits. Yeah. I don't think I was ever a bad person. I had a lot of bad habits. But um, exactly correct. I was, not, I was hanging around party animals. That was my circle of influence. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, for years, that, that ended up to a terrible marriage. That ended up in a terrible a crippling anxiety disorder. That ended up me being 50 pounds overweight. Um, that ended up I being half dead in the hospital. Ended up living in an electrical closet for a little bit. But actually, it wasn't until I changed my sphere of influence, my, my power circle. And I started hanging out with people who think a little higher. And when they're talking, I'm like, what? Because I'm used to talking to my party animals about party stuff, whatever it was. I don't remember what it was now. But then I used to, when I, when I was, when I was like, in, in like in a mastermind or something and talking to, you know, people who were trying to do bigger things, they're talking about charity. And a guy's talking to me, by, me about uh, giving the gift of vision by paying for an eye surgery for 80 bucks yeah. in a third world country. And I'm like, my mind, like, when I heard that, I felt like, I, my, I, I did, I teared up. And I'm like, dude, I just want to like sell everything I have and like give people the gift of vision because it, it, yeah. it, I mean, it sucks to be blind. You know, let's be honest. And, but I never, no one ever talked to me about these things before because I was hanging out with the wrong people. But see, one of the reasons I like your, your honesty, and we're talking to Akbar, um, is because a lot of times people think to get to a certain destination, that somebody just went in a straight line. <laughs> and the reality is you're telling me about a lot of detours, distractions, devastations. Uh, you describe something that I've never heard in my life, and you don't need to tell me what it is today. But it was—you said it's an electrical room. Yeah. Well, I lived in a in a in, in an office building in the back of an office building. It was the size of a a, a large walk-in closet. Um, well, you know, enough for a bunk bed and and and, and, a, and, a, and a free couch, but. Yeah, you know, like an electrical closet in the back of an office building, like a supply room. So yeah, I, I, I lived there for a little while with my brother. Uh, see, that's a, the that's a thing, uh, because I know you're successful. And it's a beautiful thing about being a world shaker is when you look at like a John Paul DeJora, who sold just one company, uh, Patron, for over $5 billion. Oh, wow. He used to live in his car outside of Echo Park for a long time. Huh. So there's a lot of guys that, men and women that went through like a lot of stuff yeah. before they got to certain destinations, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you one more question, but I'm gonna tell you, I, I love your vibe. 
And tell me again where you live, because I'd like to hang out with you. Thanks, man. Uh, I live in Dallas. My family's in Connecticut. I'm trying to get us back together. But I was born in Frisco. So we have to work on that of uh, when I'm in Dallas or you're in L.A., we'll talk outside of this. Sure. I'm going to dialogue with you more. I appreciate that, man. I, I love that. So, uh, Akbar, do me a favor. Tell me um, how people can learn from you. Is there books of yours or seminars or things they can buy? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that side so we can tap into to your thinking. Yeah. I, as far as like one of our babies right now is called The Coach's Secret. Yes. And it's basically like, you know, like you said, you know, people have wild journeys. And through blood, sweat, and tears, we figured out, you know, how to generate seven figures of revenue as a coach. We did a lot of things right. We did a lot of things wrong. We figured out the hard way. Um, we survived it. We, sur we kept surviving all the, all the you know, avalanches. So I turned that into an eight-week blueprint, step-by-step um, -step A to Z blueprint. Start, you know, like concept, traffic, funnel, how to sell over to keep them. The whole nine yards. Yes. Um, to really give people a shortcut so they don't have to maybe go through a lot of the pain that I went through um, to help them in essence, launch a wildly profitable and impactful coaching practice. Yes. Um, that's, that's our baby right now. I mean, I'd love to give your audience a, a freebie if, if you'd like. Yeah. Tell us about that. How's that go? Well, I have a, I have a book uh, blessed to, you know, it's a, it's an international number one bestselling book and it's called, it's called, I gotta take a deep breath. Seven Figure Funnels and Slap You in the Face of the Cold Wet Fish Blueprint on How to Build an Ethical Seven Figure Online Business in Just Seven Ethical Steps Smiley Face. Yeah. That, <laughs> I think so. A, that is a super easy uh, <laughs> title of a book. <laughs> when I showed my editor, he's like, haha, what's the real title? I'm like, nah, let's just roll with that. Well, that that's fine. <laughs> okay, so how do they get that? Well, that's for, it's $47 on Amazon but right now, but I'd love to give it to your audience for free. Uh, they just got to go to sevenfigurebook.com. Sevenfigurebook.com. You heard that right there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Akmar, thanks for taking the time today. Thank you. And um, we're going to do some stuff together. Yeah, I hope so. And stay, stay chilled and happy like this. It's working. <laughs> yeah. Just got to uh, keep my wife. Yeah, I just got to keep my wife away. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> You heard it right here, a world shakers. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Peace.